What a great hymn. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. Well, let us turn this morning in the Word of God to the Gospel of Luke. If you are visiting with us, you're very welcome this morning. And I do invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke with us. If you don't have a Bible, please avail yourself of one of the copies uh, under the seats in front of you somewhere. Uh, you're most welcome to utilize that as we read together uh, in the Word of God. We're in the 10th chapter of Luke, and we're going to read together this morning from the 13th verse. Luke chapter 10, and we're reading together from verse 13. Let us hear together the Word of God. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. And the one who hears you hears me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, it is a joy for us to sing of Jesus Christ, your Son, the one who is the Savior of the world, the one who alone is the only mediator between God and man. And we come to you now, Father, and ask on this Lord's day that you would draw near to us as we turn to your word. We pray, Father, that as we would hear the word of God, that you would speak to us that we would understand the things that you have written for our instruction through your servants. We ask, Father, that as we unpack these ver verses this morning, that you would enable us to grasp the truths of your gospel, to see the realities of our natural condition, and how we need your grace if we would ever be saved. And so, Lord, come now, we pray. Bless us as we gather under your word that Christ might be formed in each and every one of us by grace through faith in him. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are truths in the Christian faith that are hard truths. They are both hard to understand at times, and they are also hard to receive. There are truths in the Christian faith that it takes time to think through, and then to embrace, and even then, they are still somewhat complex to our finite minds, and not a little mysterious, as well as challenging. Yet if we would be sound in our faith, and firm in our commitment to Christ and to the Word of God, we are called as believers to understand the whole counsel of God as deeply as we are able. And throughout our Lord's earthly ministry, he did not shrink back from declaring things that at times were shocking, scandalous, and even offensive to those who heard him. He condemned the self-righteousness of the religious establishment without fear or favor. He warned of the dangers of failing to trust in him as the Savior of the world. He also drew back the curtain at times to allow us to gain a deeper insight into the character of God and the purpose of God in the salvation of sinners and in the judgment of the world. And as Jesus called disciples after himself, he trained them to take the message of the gospel to the world with these truths functioning in their minds and in their hearts as guidance and help to do the task that they were called to do. Underneath their commission to go into the world to proclaim the kingdom of God and to call sinners to repentance, Jesus determined that his disciples needed to be clear and strong in theology, 
clear and strong in doctrine, clear and strong in all the truths of God. And in Luke 10, we're given here an account of our Lord's instruction to 72 of his disciples, 36 couples, if you will, that he sent out into the towns and cities that he was approaching on his way to Jerusalem. And he's giving them instruction here in Luke 10 for their mission, the mission of the kingdom, their mission of the declaration of the kingdom of God. We saw the last time we gathered uh, that he lays out for them uh, in verses 1 through 12, five directives for kingdom mission. And in this section that we're turning to this morning, verses 13 through 16, Jesus continues to give them further instruction to help them in the task that he is commissioning them to do. And in this particular section that we're going to look at this morning, our Lord wants his disciples to be further grounded in the truths of God, that they might have a deeper grasp of what is going on as they go out and as they take the message of the gospel to the world. And so we're going to look at this subject and consider this morning what I'm simply calling Jesus, unbelief, sovereignty, and judgment. Jesus, unbelief, sovereignty, and judgment. And as we look at this particular section, Luke 10, verses 13 through 16, I want us to consider three things. I want us to see the warnings that Jesus pronounces, the mystery that Jesus reveals, and the truth that Jesus states. Three very simple things in many regards. The warning Jesus pronounces, the mystery Jesus reveals, the truth Jesus states. I don't always give you my points up front. I like to keep you guessing, but this morning I'm going to be generous and let you have them up front. This section of Luke records for us the pronouncement of our Lord's disdain at the unbelief of those communities that heard the message of the gospel but rejected it. It serves in many ways as a beacon of instruction to all of us this morning regarding how we are responding to the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are hard things in this text. There are difficult things in this text. But there are important things here that we need to understand if we, the church in this century, would continue to be faithful to the gospel and to carry out our commission to continue to take the gospel to the world. And so let us consider, first of all then, the warnings that Jesus pronounces as we find them here in Luke chapter 10. They're very clear. They're very straightforward. They're certainly very sobering when you consider them. Verse 13, we read this. Jesus declares, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! And then he goes on in verse 60 or verse 15 to say this. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. There are two woes declared here in this text. And there is a declaration of disaster proclaimed in this text. And so we want to look at these things under the heading of the warnings that are pronounced here by the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus is pronouncing warnings upon three communities, three towns, if you will, in these two texts. First of all, there are these two woes. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Chorazin. Now, you have to ask yourself the question, what is a woe? You ever asked that question? I asked that question this week as I was preparing this message. What is a woe? Well, it is a way of declaring the deplorable condition of something and raising attention to it by the declaration. It was used by prophets in the Old Testament to awaken Israel to its sinful state. It was used by prophets in the Old Testament to speak of the condition of surrounding nations close to Israel. It is indeed a declaration of a deplorable condition. It is a warning, a raising of attention to the deplorable condition that a particular 
person or group of people are in. And so if you were to take your time and to go back through your Bible, starting in the book of Numbers where we read of a woe, you would begin to see that this is a common idea. Uh, pronouncing woes, the, the warning of deplorable condition, usually pertaining to moral, moral deficiency, usually pertaining to deficiency in relationship to God. It's not a declaration of final judgment at this point, but rather a warning aimed at awakening the blind to their true condition. And Jesus here pronounces two of them. One he pronounces against the town of Bethsaida. The other he pronounces against the town of Chorazin. Evidently, Jesus was aware that these were towns who were in a deplorable spiritual condition, a deplorable condition towards God regarding a relationship with God. Now, Bethsaida, as far as we've been able to establish, was a town that was visited by our Lord's disciples during their first missionary effort. It was some five miles from Capernaum. The town of Chorazin is a more difficult place to nail down. Archaeologists believe it could be that it was the community now known as Kerbet Karazi. Apparently, that's two to three miles north of Capernaum. Now, if that's the case, you're talking about a, 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 an area, a geographical area of no more than five miles square. It's not a very large area, but it's an area that, as we'll see when we come to Capernaum, was very close to where Jesus' mission headquarters were set up during his time in Galilee. Now, these two communities of Bethsaida and Chorazin, they were evidently communities that had heard the good news of the kingdom of God. They were communities that had witnessed the miracles of Jesus' apostles that were verifying the coming of the anointed one, the Lord Jesus, into the world. God had sent his Son, Jesus into the world. The, the apostles, the disciples were promoting this, were proclaiming this. But these towns, Bethsaida and Chorazin, clearly had refused to believe the message of the apostles. They had continued to go on in sin and in unbelief. They would not repent. And consequently, they received this scathing indictment from the Lord Jesus himself. Their unbelief was placing them in danger of eternal condemnation. They were placing themselves in, place, in the place of true peril before a holy God, refusing to believe the message regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, here as he instructs his disciples, pronounces these woes to help them to understand that unbelief it's a deplorable moral condition to be in before a holy God. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? Unbelief is regarded by Jesus as a serious offense against a holy God. Not so much 21st century America, is it? Not so much or our Western civilization. Indeed, people will parade themselves as if they're honorable, and indeed intelligent, and indeed wise, because they don't believe, because they won't believe, because they refuse to believe. But here is Jesus, warning of the deplorable moral condition of the soul, in the state of unbelief, making it clear that as far as Jesus is concerned before his Father in heaven, unbelief is a serious offense against God. Now that's important for us to see here. That's important for us to see in our efforts to reach the world with the gospel. It's important for these men to see this in the first century. Jesus is seriously displeased at the towns that are rejecting the message of his kingdom. Unbelief for him, it's not a matter of, of, of neutrality as far as Jesus is concerned. It's a matter of willful rebellion against God and against his Father. Unbelief is not merely an intellectual matter with regards to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a moral matter. 
And brothers and sisters, I fear that the Christian church in our day has lost sight of this. As the one belief were just, well, that's just the way people are. It's just an academic choice. It's just an intellectual way of thinking. And it's not a moral issue. You know, it is a moral issue. It's a seriously moral issue. It's such a moral issue that Jesus actually pronounces woes against it. To help us understand the seriousness of it. Refusal to believe the message of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is regarded by God as wicked and sinful in character. Now that's a hard saying, isn't it? It's a hard thing for us to consider. So serious, so sinful is the issue of unbelief for Jesus that he pronounces woes against these Towns. My dear friend, if you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever in Jesus, you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ unto the salvation of your soul, you're not in a neutral condition. You're in a condition of enmity and hostility and rebellion against a holy God. And God is angry with you because of your rebellion. Because of your refusal to believe in him. Now I know that's a hard thing. I know that cuts across the modern propensities of 21st century man. But nevertheless, this is the reality of what we see here in this text. As Jesus is preparing his disciples to go out into the world. And brothers and sisters, it teaches us who are Christians to realize as we go out into the world, those who are not believing the gospel are not neutral. They are hostile. And they are not merely academic in this issue. They are immoral before God. Just as we who once were unbelieving were immoral in our unbelief. So the world in its unbelief is immoral in its unbelief. And Jesus declares the deplorable condition of man in his unbelief in these two woes. And we must be clear on that. We must see that. We must understand that. That brings us to the second thing I want you to see here. A declaration of disaster. Because having spoken these woes to Chorazin and to Bethsaida, Jesus then declares disaster for a third town. It's a town of Capernaum. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. Capernaum enjoyed great privilege in the days of Jesus. Capernaum was the headquarters of Jesus' Galilean ministry. Jesus set up home there, as it were. Turn back for a minute to Matthew uh, chapter 4. Little phrases that we can sometimes skip over. But Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12, we read this. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. Capernaum was the town that Jesus chose to live in, to take up residence in, to preach in, and to perform miracles in. From all accounts, it's quite likely that Peter and his family had property there, and Jesus worked out of there. Uh, Jesus had seen these people in the marketplace. Jesus had eyeballed them in their homes. Jesus had been mixing with them in the street. He knew about their businesses. He knew about their lives. And yet here he is, and he is declaring disaster upon them. Now, how is he declaring disaster upon them? Well, notice what he says here. The English could maybe be misunderstood if we don't read it carefully. The Greek makes it much clearer in regards to the rhetorical nature of the question that really expects a negative answer to the question Jesus is asking. Will you be exalted to heaven? Jesus is basically saying to them, no, you're going to go to hell. That's what he's saying. This idea here of Hades is more, I believe, than just the grave, which it can sometimes refer to, but it also refers to that place of everlasting punishment, that place of final judgment, if you will. And I believe that's how Jesus is using it here. He's basically declaring disaster upon Capernaum because of its unbelief. He's telling them very clearly that unbelief 
if it is continued in, and if it is not repented of, leads to eternal condemnation. That is a declaration of disaster for this town. They had all the privileges. They had all the opportunities. They saw Jesus. They heard Jesus. They, they watched his, his miracles. And yet, they would not believe in him. They would not trust in him for the salvation of their souls. They rejected him. The fate of this town that housed the Son of God and heard the Son of God and watched the Son of God was one of eternal condemnation. My dear friends, listen. You're here as an unbeliever this morning. It's my job to tell you that if you continue in your unbelief and refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, you will be eternally damned. You will end up in the place the Bible describes as where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. A place of eternal torment because of your rebellion against your Creator. Your unbelief is not a neutral thing. Your unbelief does not put you in some category outside of judgment. No, your unbelief brings you under the judgment of God and takes you to the eternal condemnation of God. And this declaration of disaster that Jesus brings to Capernaum teaches us that very thing. They had all the privileges. They had all the opportunities. They, they saw him. They heard him. They knew him. Yet they would not trust him. And Jesus declares disaster upon them. You think you're going to go to heaven, Capernaum? You're not. You're going to go to hell. That's what he said. And that's a hard saying, isn't it? That's a hard thing. That's not an easy thing. That's what I said to you. Jesus said some shocking, hard, difficult things in his earthly ministry. But these things are mercies from God. These things are important for us to grasp. These things are important for us to hear. This is, this is the mercy of God. This is the love of God to us. That we would know these things. That we would hear these things. That we would respond to these things. My dear friend, listen, if you're not a believer this morning, I don't want to see you go to hell. I don't want to see you perish in that place of everlasting punishment forever because of your rebellion. I want to warn you of your danger and of your need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that you might be saved. Jesus is telling us who are Christians, us who are his disciples, as we engage in mission, people will be in a state of unbelief and they will reject the message from time to time. We have to be prepared for that. We are going out into an unbelieving world. We're not going out into a, a, a friendly world. We're going out into a hostile world. We're going out into a world where people are blinded by the God of this world. They're blinded by their unbelief. They will not have Jesus to reign over them. And brothers and sisters, we would have been exactly the same had God never come to us and brought us to see our lostness, our rebellion, our enmity against them. And so these warnings that are pronounced here, they're warnings to help us to understand that unbelief is an offense against a holy God. And unbelief, if it is continued in without repentance, will take us to eternal destruction. But then we come to the second thing I want us to look at, and that is the mystery that Jesus reveals here. If you think these things were hard, what's about to come is going to get even harder. So buckle up and be ready. Listen to what we read here in this text. In the context of our Lord's warnings against regarding the towns of Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum, a mystery is proclaimed by our Lord about the salvation of God. And we have to consider it. Let's look at what it says again in verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. Jesus draws them all in. 
together here with that conjunction. And what do we see here? What is Jesus actually revealing to us here? Well, notice he speaks of two towns, Tyre and Sidon. He's already spoken, if you remember, back up there in verse 12, of another town, Sodom. But here he speaks of Tyre and Sidon, two Gentile towns, spoken of many times in the Old Testament, particularly if you read Isaiah chapter 23, you read something of the the prophetic words that were spoken against these towns. They were two ancient cities of the great uh, Phoenician Empire. The Phoenicians were a great seafaring people. And these towns of Tyre and Sidon, modern-day Lebanon, if you will, they were great seaports and great centers of trade and commerce. They were powerful in their own day, but they would be humbled eventually by God in judgment, and they would be humbled because of their unbelief, because of their idolatry, because of their worshiping of false gods. But notice the comparison Jesus makes here. If the mighty works done in you, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, if the mighty works had been done in them, they would have believed. Indicating, of course, that God never did them in those towns, but did them in these towns. And it will be more tolerable, more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus understood that when it comes to salvation from sin, God is absolutely sovereign. God did not choose to do the works necessary for the repentance of Tyre and Sidon. Instead, he judged them for their sin, and they perished. Jesus plainly states that the cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, they had been blessed by works sufficient for repentance. Yet they would not repent. And as a result, they were now in a worse condition, a worse position, if you will, than the cities of Tyre and Sidon who never received this blessing. And laying this reality out for his disciples, Jesus is revealing an important yet mysterious truth that his disciples needed to understand about their mission in serving Christ and bringing the message of the kingdom. The mystery Jesus proclaims is that not everyone who hears the message of the kingdom will believe it. God is sovereign in the salvation of sinners. He determines, He determines the amount of light that is given to people with regards to the gospel. He determines the level of blessing and privilege that people receive And this, in turn, determines their culpability before him. Now, that is a hard thing for us to comprehend, a hard thing for us to take. Those who hear the full gospel of Christ are the most culpable people before God if they refuse to believe it and be saved. That's what this passage is saying. It's helping us to understand something of the sovereignty of God in salvation, something of the the, the responsibility of man in salvation. I want to ask you something. Have you ever wondered why you live where you live and when you live? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever asked yourself, why do I live here and why do I live now? You could have been born in Ur of the Chaldees. And there would have been nothing you could do about it. And Abraham could have been your next door neighbor. And he could have got up and left. As you continued to worship your false gods. In unbelief. And perish in your sins. That could have been your lot. You could have been born a little bit later in history. Maybe in Athens. In Greece, during the time of Alexander the Great, merely 300 years before Christ, as opposed to 4,000 years before Christ, and you could have been studying all the ancient philosophies of Greece and remained in unbelief and perished from the world. You could have been born an Inca in Central America 
in the 14th century worshipping false gods there. But you weren't. You were born wherever it was you were born. For me, Scotland in the late 60s, 1960s. Living now in the USA in 2016. And what do we find? Light upon light upon light regarding God and Jesus and the gospel and my culpability to repent and believe in him and yours too. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why do I live here now at this time with these resources? You see, and I mentioned this last week, and it really is important to grasp this. You have access now to more books and materials about the true God of heaven and earth than any other generation that has ever existed. And let me tell you, I was reminded of that this week. Where once again, at a conference of 10,000 people, there were more Christian books going around. I mean, I don't know what the TSA must have thought at the airport at Louisville. Where everybody was trying to get their books back because we didn't have enough bags. Light upon light. They were giving Bibles away. I got two Bibles. Two Bibles. Now, I don't know who had the idea that we had to carry two bricks on our bags to get back on the plane, but two Bibles. And there were 10,000 people there, and they were all given these freely. 20,000 Bibles handed out to most of us who don't even need them. Who should be giving them away. Don't all rush at once. I've given one away. I'm going to give the other one away too, so mine are taken. See, Steve, he got some too. <laughs> the reality is, brothers and sisters, we have more light than any other generation on the planet, anytime, anywhere, right now. Access to hear about Jesus Christ coming from the Father into the world through the Virgin Mary, living a life of perfect obedience before the Father, offering himself up as the sacrifice for our sin at the place called Calvary, then rising from the dead on the third day and ascending back into heaven to sit in heavenly session as the King of Kings awaiting the day of his return to bring down the curtain on human history as we know it by judging the world and bringing all who believe in his name into his everlasting kingdom. We have all the resources to study that, understand that, and grasp it and believe it and live out our lives in the light of it. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we doing with it? You are privileged, and I am privileged beyond measure. And it's all the mercy of God to us. But that could be turned around on its head. And that could be actually used to indict us if we are not actually appropriating it to our hearts in a way that brings glory and honor to God. And for those of you who are here who are not Christians, you have access to that like we do. And your culpability is great living in the good old USA in the 21st century. There are parts of the world to this day who yet need the gospel. There are unreached people groups to this day who need the gospel. But let me tell you this, we are not them. As one commentator says, Bethsaida and Chorazin and Capernaum went to the bottom of God's list. Or rather, to the top of God's list for judgment. Well, if that's the case, where are we in comparison to them? I don't know about you, but when I hear of earthquakes in Japan, and earthquakes in Ecuador, and the Pacific Rim has been rumbled again by God, we have to ask ourselves the question, when is it coming to California? When is it coming to the US of A? It's only a matter of time. God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. Whatsoever we sow, we're going to reap. Are we sowing to righteousness? Or are we sowing to sin? You see, Christ makes it clear here. God has chosen who to give light to. 
And if we do not avail ourselves of that light unto the salvation of our souls, but we spurn it and we reject it, it will be a mistake that will cost us even our eternal salvation. And I exhort you this morning, dear Christian, avail yourself of all that you've been given and use it as much as you can for the glory of God and the salvation of sinners. And for those of you who are unsaved this morning, I say to you this morning, you live in a place and you have access to blessing of such a magnitude that for you to spurn the love of Jesus, for you to reject the overtures of grace, for you to refuse the offers of mercy, puts you at the top of the list for God's judgment. And again, I know that's a hard thing to say. I get that. I understand that. That's difficult. But Jesus is teaching us some hard things here. He's teaching us as a church the importance of understanding these things as we go into the world to present the gospel. Where there is light, there is hope of salvation. We need to be going into the world bringing the light of the word of God to as many people as we can that they might hear the gospel knowing that then it's on them regarding their culpability with what they do. Just as it's on us regarding what we do. That brings us then to the third and final thing I want to look at this morning. The truth that is stated here by Jesus. And we find it in the last verse of our text. Verse 16. The one who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Having pronounced his warnings, having revealed divine mystery, our Lord closes this part of his instruction to his disciples with a very straightforward and clear statement of truth. What is our Lord saying to his disciples here by way of these things? Well, remember again the wider context of this passage. It is the mission of the kingdom that Jesus has in focus here. He's instructing 72 disciples that he's sending out on gospel mission. He's giving them instruction here for what we might call evangelism. Those of you who were in my class this morning, uh, we started on this whole subject of evangelism. Well, our Lord here is making it clear in this final statement of truth in this section that when it comes to the matter of fruit in evangelism, the matter of fruit in evangelism, and it comes to the matter of divine sovereignty and unbelief and human responsibility and judgment... There is only one thing that we need to be concerning ourselves with, notwithstanding our knowledge of these great truths. Those who hear the servants of Jesus and embrace what they teach are the ones who are being saved. And those who reject the servants of Jesus and don't receive what they are saying, reject Jesus and they ultimately therefore reject God and they are not being saved. That's what we need to understand. That's what we need to grasp. I, I love how Jesus is so clear here to his disciples that the danger could be, well, where do we minute, Jesus? What about the decree of God? Well, where do we minute? What about election and reprobation? And how does that work with human responsibility? And, you, and all the kind of discussions that we've all got ourselves entangled in at times. It's not that these things don't matter. Of course they do. We've got to understand them. We've got to understand them properly. We've got to understand them biblically. That's why Jesus is teaching them here. But the reality is that Jesus boils it all down to this issue regarding our mission in the world. The ones who are hearing the gospel and believing it are the ones who are receiving Jesus. And the ones who are hearing the gospel and rejecting it are rejecting Jesus and rejecting God the Father at the same time. Our Lord is wanting us to understand that when it comes to the issue of kingdom evangelism, we are to go into the world, as Spurgeon said, and preach the gospel to everyone and leave the saving up to God. Leave the saving up to God. You know, God will do it. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And our responsibility as the church is to take the gospel into the world and know that as we present the gospel to the world, those who are receiving it are the ones that God is working in and those who are rejecting it are the ones that God is not yet working in. That doesn't mean we don't go back and give them it again and give them it again, but nevertheless, we have to be clear on this. Why? Because Jesus wants us to understand we are going into a world of unbelief. 
We are going into a world of hostility. There's nobody out there with a God-shaped heart just waiting for you to drop in that little thing to make them a Christian. They are actually at enmity with God. Now, it's true that the degree of these things varies. Praise the Lord that it does. That we're not all as bad as we could be. That's absolute depravity. Imagine what the world would be like if that was the case. We could not live. We'd be dead. Or at least those of us who were not as strong as the ones who were doing the killing would be dead. Or whatever it would be. It would be a mess. But here we see very clearly that as we take this message of Christ to the world, as we go into this unbelieving world, this world that is at enmity with God, this world that does not want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be sure of this, that those who are hearing the gospel and believing it, they are the ones that God is working in. Those whom the Lord, who are rejecting it, those are the ones whom the Lord is not working in. And we continue to hold our nerve and be faithful to the end. That's what these disciples needed to hear as they were being sent out on this mission. And you see, my dear brother, my dear sister, what does that translate into for you? That worker in the office that you've been witnessing to wants to meet you again, wants to talk to you more, would like to hear some more about Jesus, wants to know more about the gospel. Who knows how the Spirit of God is at work, but he's, the door's still open. That other person just cuts you off, doesn't want to know, what do you do? You've got to keep praying. You've got to keep seeking the Lord for the mercy of God to come upon them. Maybe the first conversation didn't go so well because you weren't so good at how you presented it. But maybe there'll be another opportunity. But whatever the case, those who hear the message of the gospel are hearing Christ. Those who are believing it are being saved by Christ. Those who are rejecting it, they are rejecting Christ and they are rejecting the Father. And we know that salvation is of the Lord. And we must leave it there. We must be okay with that. We must be motivated by that, but we must understand that. Those who are hearing the Word of God, call them to repentance. And that might be you this morning. You're here. You're not a Christian. You're hearing me call you to repentance as a ma an ambassador of Christ to your soul, as a representative of Christ to your soul. You're hearing that. You're aware of that. You're conscious that you are an unbeliever. You need to put down the weapons of your hostility. You need to bow the knee to Jesus. You need to turn from your sins. And if that is happening, that's happening because Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, through the Spirit and the Word, is dealing with your soul. But if you're still sitting there dead, uninterested, bored, maybe even sleeping under even the loudness of my voice, you say, well, God's not dealing with me. Oh, God's dealing with you. You're responsible for shunning and rejecting the light that's been shed even this morning upon your mind and on your heart through the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God and your unbelief will take you to eternal condemnation. Why would you die? Why would you go on in your unbelief and perish? Come to Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in Him for the forgiveness of your sins. Be done with your rebellion. Lay down your weapons and bow before the King. He is a glorious Lord. Merciful, kind, patient, loving saving. That would be my plea with you. That would be my plea with you. Dependent on the Spirit of God to be working in your life. Dependent upon God to be showing you these things. Those who hear and believe are hearing Christ. Those who are rejecting are rejecting Christ and rejecting God. We need to be aware of this whether it be in our workplace, whether it be with our loved ones and our families, some whom we've tried to witness to for years. Do you find that the family is sometimes the toughest to witness to? You know, witness to a stranger on the street who you never see again, an in an airplane, someone you never see again. But oh, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? Well, they're rejecting Jesus. I understand that. God doesn't seem to be at worry. I understand. So what do you do? Pray. Lord, open their heart. Lord, soften their heart. Lord, 
bring them by your mercy and your grace to hear, believe, and be saved. Your great recourse is Christ. Go to him. Plead with him. See, Jesus is teaching his disciples here all about the hardness of missions. An unbelieving world. A hostile world. A world that refuses to bow to Christ. But he's reminding them God is in control. The Lord will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. Seek me. Trust me. Be confident of this. Those who hear me, I'm working with. Those who are rejecting, they're responsible. They're unbelieving. Don't be surprised by that. Embrace that. Work with that. You see, the work of the kingdom is in the hand of God, brothers and sisters, ultimately. And we must simply proclaim Christ. And leave the rest up to him. Salvation is of the Lord. And man is totally responsible for his unbelief. That's what the Bible teaches. I'm not saying that's easy to understand. I'm not saying there's not mystery in regards to that. I'm not saying that's not difficult to comprehend. But that's what the Bible teaches. Salvation is of the Lord. And man is totally responsible for his condition. You've got to live with that. You say, well, how do I reconcile it? Well, I always hide behind Spurgeon. My good old friend. I don't have to reconcile friends. Sovereignty and responsibility are friends. You don't have to reconcile them. You just embrace both realities. You're responsible for your unbelief this morning. You won't be able to blame God on the final day. You've chosen the way of unbelief. What you need is mercy. What you need is mercy from the Lord that you might turn from your unbelief and you might lay down your weapons and you might be saved. And I exhort you, seek the Lord for mercy. He is merciful. He delights to be merciful. Be done with your unbelief. Our Lord's warning regarding the towns who would not receive his message is scathing. Woe unto you. Woe unto you, Rosemont. Woe unto you, Elk Grove. Woe unto you, Midtown. Woe unto you, Sacramento. Woe unto you, California. Woe unto you, United States of America. And the United Kingdom, just in case you get nervous. Woe! The deplorable condition of your unbelief is taking you to hell. Turn. Believe. It also reveals to us, doesn't it, the mystery of God's grace. Why does he give light to us? And not light to others. Why does he give us these opportunities and not to others? These are the mysteries of God. No way diminishing it for any of us, our responsibility before him. Merely heightening our responsibility and our culpability. You see, we have received the full light of God's truth in this place. In this city. In this country. We have received the full light of God's truth in the person and work of Jesus Christ, making us the most culpable of all people in the history of the world. This morning, let us hear the good news of Christ. Let us believe it, that we might prove the glorious realities of grace in our lives and not receive the horror of his eternal condemnation on the final day because... We would not believe in him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we close our time in your word, we recognize that there are things in it that are hard. There are things in it that cut across our human pride. There are things in it that we don't like because of our innate arrogance and pursuit of autonomy. But we pray this morning, Father, that you would come by your grace and you would deliver us from unbelief. That you would reveal afresh the glory of Christ. The salvation of grace. To each and every one of us, Lord. That there would be no one in this place. Who would refuse to believe in Jesus Christ to the salvation of their souls. Work by the power of your Spirit, we pray. Cause us to bow before the King. To worship Him. And to serve Him all the days of our life. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.